In this video, we are going to be going over chapter nine, the higher invertebrates of the ocean. And you can look at these key concepts later, but we're going to scroll past them for now and just move on to mollusks. So in phylum mollusca, that is the squid, the snails, the clams, octopuses, or chitons. These are soft bodied organisms that are covered by a calcium carbonate shell. And I know what you're thinking. What about something like the octopus that does not have this hard shell? Well, these, this is actually a very diverse group that has a lot of different members. So they're not all the same, but that's just the general is that they're, most of them are soft bodied with a hard shell. And I want to give a shout out to this stubby squid that is found in Southern California that is just the cutest. And you can look up more on him if you want to. So on the molluscan body, there's two major body parts. One is the head foot that is like the bottom of like a snail, if you can picture that, that has the mouth and the sensory organs and then the foot. And then inside it actually has a visceral mass that has what you would consider like the organs, like the circulatory system, the digestive system, respiratory, excretory, and reproductive systems. So the mantle makes the shell of the mollusk, although in some of these, the mantle like the squid here, um, the mantle is just this softer, a muscle tissue here that actually contracts and helps them the organism move. They also have this very interesting ribbon of tissue in here containing teeth called the radula and the radula um, help the organism to eat really effectively, especially in grazing. So um, this is a general body plan of mollusks with this outer shell and the mantle. And you can see very distinct um, organ like systems inside of here. Here's like the heart that's um, attached to the gills for respiration. You also see the mouth that can intake food that goes to the digestive system. And then it, it spins around and goes um, all the way to the anus. You have this head, foot and nervous tissue and whole nervous system that's here. So another up close of its mouth shows the radula, which are these teeth. And these teeth can actually be regenerated at the front end if they get broken off. It has a salivary gland. And then there's a lot of muscle attachment here that will actually flex and relax this different um, radula to help this tongue go and eat and graze. This is a video by Shape of Life Mollusk Animation abalone body plan where you can see more about that. So um, the mantle actually has uh, three different layers. It ha has this outside area that protects the shell from being dissolved or from boring organism. This is called the periostracum. Then it's got a middle layer uh, called the prismatic layer, and that has the bulk of the calcium carbonate or protein in the shell. And then it has this nacreous layer, which is this smooth inside. It's usually an iridescent color of the shell that constantly keeps growing. There's um, one type of uh, mollusk called a chitin. They have eight shell plates you find them in southern california and they seem like they can almost cement themselves to the rocks um, when you find them in tide pools but that's just as protection they are capable of moving and scraping algae off of rocks this is a video from deep marine scenes facts on the chitons so the scaphopods actually are tusk shelled organisms and they, when you see these shells, a lot of people think it is a broken off um, piece like a tooth from another organism and they think they can take it as a souvenir. You should not do that because this is actually a living animal called a scaphopod. They um, protrude into the sand and they leave their small end out. And this is for um, filtering water through, but their mouth and their foot are down towards the bottom and they eat the tiny little um, foramens that we learned about earlier that are basically these gorgeous little intricate shelled animals that are like the size of sand. That's what they are eating down here. Here's a video by Animal Fact Files, Tusk Shell Facts, the tooth shelled mollusk, and you can look up a little more information on them there. So gastropods 
are organisms that gastropod actually means stomach foot, but they can be um, unshelled like the nudibranchs or they can have a univalve shell like this. In order to protect them inside of the, the, themselves, they actually have something called an operculum and you can see it here in this picture. The operculum will close up and it's like a trap door to keep them moist and protected inside. This trap door can be um, horny, meaning it's made out of a stiff protein, or it can be calcareous, made out of calcium. For feeding and nutrition, snails can can eat. It can be herbivores, carnivores, scavengers, deposit feeders, suspension feeders, all kinds of things. Here's a video by Deep Look. Watch these uh, cunning snails stab and swallow fish whole. And then I put a gif here because I thought it was so um, cool to illustrate it. Here's just a snail that actually releases like a paralyzing type of fluid into the water and you can see these fish are just almost incapable of moving away like almost like a nightmarish kind of thing like i was trying to move but i wasn't going anywhere that's what's happening to those fish and then this snail just grabs them and brings them in so of the gastropods my personal favorite is the nudibranchs they are often called nudies because that's the friend of their name is nudibranchs but nudibranchs actually means naked gills and they are so gorgeous and they have so many different cool adaptations i just love seeing them one that you see very commonly in southern california is the spanish shawl um, these organisms actually have these serrata, which are these feathery projections on the backs of their bodies. And they fill these things often with other animals stolen body parts so they will go up to some like an echinoderm which is one of the spiny skins they'll actually eat the spines but instead of digesting it they actually push it up into their serrata and then they have the toxins and the spine from that other organism up in their serrata so if they get bitten you know that spine and the toxins are there but that's not the only cool thing they can do there's like lots of different um, types of nudibranchs that have other different adaptations so i highly recommend you watch videos like this animal fact fight file um sea slug facts aka nudibranch facts they just are really really cool little guys um they're brightly colored oftentimes to warn of their toxicity uh to different predators here's another video um, of them called deep look this adorable sea slug is a sneaky little thief so they do have um, generally separate sexes where they have a penis that basically harpoons the genital of the females that they want to impregnate. Nate, some of them actually ha are hermaphrodites where they have um, male and female genitals so that they can both harpoon another one's vagina and get harpooned themselves. So they will shed their eggs into the um, water column just like... Um, a few different organisms we're going to talk about here they have two phases of their larva where they have the tocophore which is the more immature phase and the villager stage which is a little bit more of a developed larva moving around um, this is a video from isabella vey meet the scientist working on the crazy sex life of slipper limpets um, that i'll talk to you about for a minute this is a different type of gastropod where they actually have multiple multiple of them will congregate on top of each other they are born initially all male and as they congregate on each other they will insert their penis into the female that's the biggest one down below um, eventually if one male gets large enough um, he will actually break off from or gets broken off from the group he will actually dissolve his male genitalia and grow on his own female genitalia and the process can start again like that okay moving on to bivalves here's a video from deep marine scenes facts on the giant clam when i was in australia you wouldn't see these commonly but we did see them um, on a few different um, dive spots that was really cool they are actually almost as big as me they're huge and they have 
um, mutualistic symbiotic relationships with um, different plankton that give them this bioluminescent glowy feature and they are definitely a species worth our protection. So different bivalves include um, clams, oysters, mussels, or like here in this gift, like a scallop. They also include shipworms. So here's a video if you haven't heard of those. Bizarre beasts, the clam, um, this clam sinks ship, ships. This is um, one type of, of bivalve that can bore its way into wood and can eat the wood and basically um, cause a lot of damage. They're part of obviously the fouling community that wrecks up um, boats and things that humans care about. So um, bivalves in general don't have a head or radula. They have a shell though that's attached and it's attached at a place like underneath here called the umbo. So it's that is kind of like if you've ever seen these and they have like a hinge that would be near the umbo and they actually have adductor muscles that can open and close the shell in the different valves so this is um, a really cool uh, bivalve and i know what you're thinking when you're looking at it it looks like it can't even um, close its shell anymore that it's like impossible it's outgrown it and it has and this is a type of bivalve that you can find all up and down the coasts of um, california and it's called a gooey duck and different people actually eat them for food but it sticks out um, and will actually siphon and filter different food out of the water so here's a video from deep marine scenes facts of the pacific gooey duck not geoduck um, it's called a gooey duck um, and you can see how it behaves and has its different lifestyle okay so um, also bivalves generally have separate sexes and they release their egg and sperm into the water column they have larva again the two stages the trochophore with the uh, more immature larval stage and then the villager is the more advanced stage some of them are hermaphroditic where they ha can release egg and sperm so video from daily picks and flicks clam digs into the sand where you can check that out and a video from um, iowa pbs muscle reproduction process this is actually talking about a freshwater bivalve but i wanted to include it here just because it shows some of the diversity of their reproductions and they do a good job of what that looks like. Um, some of these bivalves will even create lures that look like a little distressed fish that um, larger fish wanna come down and eat. And they'll make this fake little lure and the fish come down. And when it does, it'll squirt all of its um, fertilized eggs into the gills of the fish. The fish swims away and it's got all these baby bivalves growing in its gills. And when the bivalves get big enough, they actually will drop off and land in different places far away from the parent so that they don't have to compete with the parent organism. It's just really interesting. So here are different cephalopods, another strong favorite of mine. Cephalopod specifically means head footed and that's because it looks like their head is also on their foot. They use tentacles to capture prey, but they also use their tentacles for defense, reproduction, and um, in many cases, movement as well. Um, most of them lack shells like um, this one here that is the cuttlefish and I want to move back to this um, the nautilus though has a shell and this is what a nautilus looks like not the minecraft version um, this is what a nautilus looks like and it almost seems impossible that it could float but then here when you look at it um, swimming along this giant heavy shell that's floating and it does that by actually off-gassing its air into chambers that are in the top of its shell 
and then it actually uses a jet propulsion to just kind of float along in the water column and it can maintain this neutral buoyancy by adjusting how much air is inside of it just like a diver would do. It's just so interesting. These guys have about nine, 60 to 90 tentacles. They tend to eat um, hermit crabs or scavenge on the bottom. Here's a video by Deep Marine Scenes, Facts on the Nautilus. And here's another video by Animal Fact Files, Nautilus, Facts, older than dinosaurs. They have been on this earth for a really long time, but because of their gorgeous shells, they are being hunted to extinction. This is an animal that also deserves our protection. They can't breed until they are about 10 to 15 years old on the, the females, need to be 10 to 15 years old before they can breed. And even then they only lay about a dozen eggs a year. And then again, how many of those actually end up surviving to adulthood? Probably very few. So there's very few of these in the ocean and we need to be really careful with this as an organism. Inside of their shell, this is what it looks like with the different chambers. And then it's got a straw of the center that it off gases into to make itself flow and release air called the siphuncle that is there. It's just really cool. Okay. Other kinds of cephalopods are ones that are the colioids with no shells like the cuttlefish squid or octopus. And they move along by jet propulsion and by squeezing that mantle like we've talked about. But these guys have a very advanced complex nervous system and are highly, highly intelligent in my opinion. So um, here's a video by BBC Earth. Cuttlefish mimics female to male. Um, when you go and watch this video and also when you look up other ones, you'll see that like in this video, there is a giant mating congregation there of lots of um, cuttlefish together and they're there to mate. And there's a very, very large male that's there and he's obviously getting most of the breeding rights with the much smaller females. And then a very small male comes along. He's so small that he's basically the size of a female. So what he does is males and females have different coloration. He actually flushes his body to have the same coloration as the female so that the bigger male doesn't chase him off then he also tucks his tentacles underneath him so that he presents more like a female so the bigger male sees him he thinks it's a, a female he's not deterred by him he doesn't chase him off and the much smaller male then goes and cuddles up with a female and mates with her and then gets away with it now the female actually has mated with several males at this point so um, so she keeps, um, mating with multiple so that she has multiple choices in the sperm that gets released, but it's just really interesting to see how this goes and how a much smaller male can by trickery, um, still gain breeding rights. So cephalopods can change their color and their shape. Um, they actually have a cell inside called the chromatophores and an ink inside of there. The ink can be squirted into the water column to confuse predators um, or, or even prey in some cases. But the ink is called sepia and the ink is specifically a type of melanin. Just like humans have melanin in our, in our skin, they have melanin, but they can actually have their melanin um, shift its location. Here's a video by Dmitry um, Salenkov. Uh, octopus changes color and texture. So you can see in this video how that happens. But even in this GIF, this octopus is ch able to change over and over again to match his surroundings in order to hide. Here's another GIF um, that I put in here that shows um, the mantle of this squid filling up with water and then getting shot out through the siphon in order to move. But back to their really cool chromatophores. The way that this is working is the pigment is held in the center of um, various cells that are, it's kind of held in like a, a bubble area. And so the melon is all there in one place and then it's connected by different muscles that radiate outward from it. When these muscles contract, if you can see, there's actually these spacious canals going down the sides of the muscles. When the muscles pull in all directions, it flattens out this central disc with the pigment inside. And then that pigment gets flushed 
down the cell in different directions, making it so that it can shift um, its color and move it around. Um, okay, so it's just very cool how that works. So um, with feeding and nutrition, they are carnivores, they have beak-like jaws, their diet um, varies depending on their habitat. This is a video by Getty Images. Mimic Octopus, the Master of Disguise. This is a really cool octopus that can change its um, shape and its um, coloration to match like six different um, scary things in the ocean so that it doesn't get bothered itself. Um, a very common um, octopus octopus in the Southern California oceans is called the Bimac or the California two spot octopus. It has two big blue spots, one on each side of its head, and you'll often find it in sea walls kind of just hiding away there. So um, in cephalopods, they do have separate sexes and they have um, a, a kind of a very um, strong courtship display. They have an arm that transfers um, sperm called the spermatophore. Um, once they have basically bred, it, they have what is called a terminal breeding in many cases where the male female breed and they do this in some cases um, along with different cycles of the moon, but the males will die after they have bred with the females and their bodies will float or sink to the bottom of the ocean. And then the females will actually swim down and they'll lay their eggs amongst the dead bodies and stick them to the bottom ocean floor. And then after they've laid all their eggs, the female will then die. Then their bodies act as a protectant because other organisms that end up swimming by will just choose to eat the large parent body instead of trying to go and find these um, different little... Um, eggs that are all in that area. Here's a video by Deep Marine Scenes, Facts, the Giant Squid, and here's a video by BBC Earth, Color Changing Squid Mating Ritual. So we are on to the annelids. Annelids are segmented worms that have um, a hydrostatic skeleton. So you can see the segments and their hydrostatic skeleton is one where they fill it with water and that actually pressurizes it. They have seti, which are venomous hairs that they use for protection and parapodia that can function for locomotion, gas exchange, feeding um, on different species and things like that. Then there's the sepunculids. These are benthic worms, meaning they live on the bottom of the seafloor. They live in burrows. Some can live in tubes. They're often called the peanut worms. Um, and different humans will actually fish for them. And here's a video of that happening called the Shambo Fishing, how to catch a peanut worm um, with a simple tool. And they basically just use a tube and, and push it into the sand and pull it out. And it has a peanut worm. They knew some kind of worm, probably a peanut worm was there because of the different hole that's left behind from the filtering that it's doing. So polychaetes are traditionally divided into two different groups. They also reside in my nightmares. There's the errant polychaetes that can move around and sedentary polychaetes. Um, this specific polychaete actually has what like a spring loaded trap door on these different claw like spines. And when it senses something going by, it will reach out and extend its body out of the water. And then when this spring loaded mechanism is, is tripped, it will release these spines very rapidly into the organism. And then the whole body of this polychaete will contract and it'll pull the organism down into the sand and eat it. Um, making this even more terrifying, and I recommend you kind of look it up, polychaete bodies can be exceptionally long. So all you're seeing is this tiny part, but they can go huge. They can be very, very long underneath the, the sand, which makes it even more terrifying. A different type of polychaete is also called the lugworm. A lugworm is actually an organism like you can find them in different parts um, of the world, but I've seen them very commonly like in Mexico, like Belandra Beach, where these guys will actually just stay in the sand and instead of fishing for fish like this, they're just filtering the sand all the time. And they actually make a 
excrement that looks exactly like the poo emoji, a nice like circular poo shape. And they're actually, that poo shape seems really gross because of the shape, but it's actually very, very clean filtered sand from them eating out all of the debris. So here's um, another polychaete uh, video by Natural World Facts Deep Sea Worms. So these guys obviously can be deposit feeders, like eating and filtering out sand. They can be predators, filter feeders, suspension feeders. Any of those are all different choices. Also with polychaetes, their reproduction um, can be asexual by budding where they make a little mini me and break it off um, or by fragmenting where they can get ripped in half and also make another piece. Um, but a lot of them are actual actually have sexual reproduction where their gametes are released into the water column um, and they have this epi epitoke phase and they usually congregate by swarming um, linked to the lunar cycles. Here's a video by um, Igor Automakeo and the epitoke of the polychaete worm. But I wanted to show you these videos of other polychaetes because they're actually very, very interesting to me. Um, this is a video by Nathan Sagapoletele, um, but this is pololo hunting in American Samoa. This is a very traditional thing um, to have the pololo hunting. This is a type of polychaete that breaks off the end piece here. And this is filled with eggs and that kind of squirms, moves, swims on its own up to the top, filled with fertilized eggs that it releases and creates millions of new um, polychaete worms in the water. And people fish for these where humans eat these worms um, in huge numbers. Um, it's a very traditional Samoan thing um, to do this. Here's another video by um, Sesame Creepas, um, eating worms, 100,000 slimy, wriggly, juicy worms. You can see here in this picture, there's a darker brown, I think it's called a red version though, and then a very distinctive green version. I believe the brownish red version is the male and the green is the female, but you can actually see in these videos that even humans, I mean, fish obviously go crazy for this and will feast on this, but additionally, humans will basically go and grab these and eat them um, just totally raw, still moving. And um, it's considered like a very traditional thing to eat and a delicacy that time of year to go and do that. So um, this is the icky urines. These are um, deposit feeders. They will filter through and get the edible material out of the water. They have separate sexes and they shed their gametes into the water column. These are also found in Southern California. This is a video by CBS um, San Diego. Pink spoonworm washes up on Coronado beaches and you can see what that looks like. The um, pogonorphorins, um, they live in various tubes and have a cylindrical shaped body. These don't have a mouth or digestive tract. Instead, if you watch these videos, and I highly recommend you do, it'll get close up on these guys. Looking at them from a distance, they do not look like they're pretty at all, and that's okay. But when you look at them up close, this red part is actually very, very feathery, and that's for absorbing nutrients. These uh, worms actually are a very important part of deep sea vents because they will actually pull different nutrients. There's no sunlight down there by these deep sea vents. And these deep sea vents are letting off different um, chemicals from deep inside the earth, but they're inorganic chemicals. They actually will have a symbiotic relationship, a mutualistic relationship with um, some bacteria that live in their tissues and the bacteria can um, take these um, inorganic chemicals and turn them into organic body material, like a living organism material. And it's really cool that they're able to do that. And then a whole community can live because these worms are able to do that down there. Here's a video by Evie Nautilus, fire uh, riftia tube worms near the Guyamas uh, Basin Vents from Nautilus Live. So nematodes. Nematodes are exceptionally numerous on 
earth. They are critical scavengers. Some are parasitic. Most are hermaphrodites having male and female parts. Their quantity though, their scientists estimate there's about 57 billions of these for every one human on the planet. Very, very numerous and have been around since um, just, just early, early Earth's time. So here's a video by Journey into the Microcosmos, Nematodes, the worm that sculpted the world um, for more information on nematodes. So what is the point or the ecological role of marine worms? Well, like I said earlier, I mean, even doing something like making it possible for um, deep sea vent communities to even exist by being able to uh, turn inorganic material into body material that can then be eaten upon. They form symbiotic relationships um, like predator prey relationships or um, they cycle nutrients around. Here is a video on Christmas tree worms, a video by PBS Nova official, Meet the Marvelous Christmas Tree Worms. These um, worms actually live on top of coral. And as you swim up to the coral, they'll actually suck down into their hole a lot like what you see on this gif, but they look different, but they're so beautiful. Um, and then a video by Deep Marine Scenes Facts, Feather Duster Worm. Um, here is... Um, an arthropod because we're going to move on to arthropods and one of them that is molting out of its exoskeleton. So they have different jointed appendages that you can see here and when their exoskeleton gets too small they will crawl out of it and within a short amount of time like a few days they will regrow a hardened shell. So there's the chelicerates that have appendages that are modified into like mouth parts for eating. And those are like the horseshoe crabs and sea spiders. And then you'll have the mandibulates, which have appendages on their head. Um, think lobster claws um, that are modified for feeding like crabs and lobsters. So here's a video by Shape of Life, arthropods, blue crab molting. So with the chelicerates, which is like the horseshoe crab, they have six pairs of appendages. They have three main body regions like the cephalothorax, which is um, has the paired appendages. They also have the abdomen down here that has the gills and it's hard to see it here, but it's kind of flapping kind of in a feathery way there. And then they have the telson that is like the tail that's sticking off here, or the spine that looks like it's for steering or defense. And then they have this outside big carapace that is the hard outer covering. Um, so Chelicerates are actually sea spiders, but they are they're called sea spiders, but they're not actually spiders. Um, but they look a heck of a lot like spiders. Um, they have four four or more um, sets of legs, so they're minimally they have eight legs, but you can see ones that look like they have thirty legs. Um, the males actually carry. Uh, the eggs and they feed off of juices from cnidarians and other soft body invertebrates and they have a sucking proboscis so in a lot of ways they act a lot like a spider um, even though they aren't spiders so here's a video by animal fact files um, see spider facts they aren't spiders is what the video is called so the mandibulates um, which uh, are like lobsters they have the head they have a thorax and then they have an abdomen. They also often have antenna that are for like a sensory organ and they have mandibles and maxillae, um, the maxillae for eating. Here's a video by Deep Marine Scenes, facts on the crustaceans. And then a video by National Geographic, watch carrier crab uses spiny urchin as a sh shield. This is really interesting because it's a type, um, a carrier crab is one that will move along and for its own protection, it will grab like a jellyfish and hold it upside down on its shell and walk around so that nothing can grab it because it's holding a jellyfish with one pair of its mandibles. Um, or it'll grab something like an urchin and walk around with an urchin on top of it. And then if a fish is like, eh, forget it, I'm just gonna dive low and dip under that jellyfish or urchin, it will actually quickly burrow under the sand, but just leave the jellyfish hanging out on top. 
So um, it's just an interesting uh, relationship there that it will use other organisms. So mandibulates will molt where they will eventually outgrow their exoskeleton. They will break it off here at their old like carapace and they will rupture between the carapace and the abdomen and then they will slowly just keep wiggling until they get out of this thing and then within a few days it will grow an all new shell but it is something that looks like it is also part of nightmares and then the old shell just stays behind um sometimes you will find these molts up on the um beach and um, usually, you know, sometime in the winter, you'll see a lot of those. So decapods have five pairs of walking legs, like crabs, lobster, or shrimp. The, these are like a real picture and how big it can get. Um, they have chilipeds, which is the first pair of legs that are modified as pinchers. And those chilipeds will, are actually pinchers for defense, but they can also, um, be something that catches food for them. And these can range um, a huge amounts in their size. Um, different types of decapods are like the hermit crab that you know really well that changes its shell. Here's a video on that by BBC Earth. Crabs trade shells in the strangest way. Um, some hermit crabs can be like the one in the last gift where they just grab one that's the next size up and they jump into it. Okay, that's one way. But another way, some hermit crabs have actually evolved a mechanism where a group of them will congregate on um, like seaside and they will actually line up based on their size and get in order from tallest to smallest. And then... Um, when the biggest one is near a shell that it wants to move into, the it will move into the bigger shell and every one down the line will move into the shell one up from it. So you can see what that looks like in the video. So they use their appendages for scavenging. There's also decorator crabs that literally grab different objects and decorate their shells for a disguise. And like common blue crabs, they swim like a propeller. Um, this, um, uh, California spiny sand crabs, when you go and try in Southern California, a lot of people dig up, um, spiny crabs. Um, they're the tiny little sand crabs at the beach and they put them in buckets and let them go. And, um, those are actually a type of decapod. Um, also in Southern California, we have something called the fiddler crab. It's in a lot of different places though, but you can see that their first modified appendage is actually really, really, really big on the male. And they do this to show off to each other, um, but also to attract a female. So this is a huge like flex thing. You can see in this gift behind that there's actually one without a big claw coming out of this hole. Well, this is actually a female and because she doesn't have the modified appendage, she can actually eat considerably faster than the male because they just find little dead detritus in the sand and that's what they eat out of the sand. So females are actually a lot more effective at eating. It's the job of the male to make a really cool hole as his house and then they will stand outside and flex to each other to try to attract a male or a female and then the females will actually climb down into each hole inspecting it and she will um, lay eggs and mate with a male if she is happy with how he built his home. So um, most of them brood their eggs. Here's a video by PBS official why fiddler crabs have such giant claws and you can look at more of that okay these guys are beautiful but terrifying called the mantis shrimp mantis shrimp if you don't know much about them i highly recommend you watch videos on them um some of them mate for life here's a video by Nat national geographic wild um, mantis shrimp packs a punch predator in paradise Basically, these uh, shrimp can see a ton of colors that we can't even see, um, which is amazing. I think it's like four times more colors than what we can see. They actually can punch so hard that it has the strength of a 22 caliber bullet. Um, the low pressure that is made in the water behind their punch actually ends up collapsing in on itself and gives off light and heat 
in a re reaction that like the heat can be 80, 8,500 um, degrees Fahrenheit. And I'm sure you don't believe that at all if you don't know much about mantis shrimp. So I recommend you fact check me and watch a few videos on these guys. But basically, if they want you dead, it's going to happen. And they will go up to different shelled organisms and take them out really quickly with their punches. Okay, so krill. Not nearly as terrifying as the mantis shrimp are krill. And they are pelagic, meaning they live in the open water column. They're very, very small and they're filter feeders. And a lot of them are bioluminescent. Um, and here's a video by Animal Fact File, Krill Facts, the lifeblood of marine ecosystems. It's called the lifeblood because they go and eat the tiniest things in the ocean water but are a major, major food source. For instance, blue whales can eat as much as 8,000 pounds of krill a day when they are all congregating. Another type of organism are the amphipods. They are laterally compressed. Um, here's a video uh, from Salt Strong, the easiest way to catch sand fleas. These eat detritus or are scavengers. Okay. Copepods. I put a gif here of plankton from SpongeBob because um, copepods are actually modeled after uh, plank or plankton was modeled after copepods. You can see that he um, has an antenna just like real copepods, a large singular eye, um, a little round body, and then two legs at the bottom. The only things missing are those those arms. Um, but, and the attitude, but, um, copepods actually, uh, can emit their bioluminescent in many cases. They can emit light. They are suspension feeders and the males use spermatophores to transfer their sperms and egg. Eggs are actually shed and hatched into the water column. Okay, barnacles. When you go walking in the tide pools, especially in Southern California, and you walk on the rocks, there's all these like really hard, um, in some spaces, these really hard, like almost cutting, feet cutting types of extensions. Those are all living barnacles and you should be really careful with how you step or walk in those spaces. Barnacles actually, um, when they are not covered by water, they kind of hide and retract and all you see are these little holes. But then they have this like slit light, like trapdoor opening where they can let out a feathery extension. When the water is over them, they will extend this feather and it will trap and filter different things out in the water. And then they bring those things down inside in order to eat. So they have a calcium carbonate shell. The um, a feathery extension is called the syruped that they release. You won't see it when it's dry, but you will see it when it's underwater. Um, but in this GIF, I didn't just put it there to show the syrupeds. I also show put this GIF here to show that they actually do have a long extendable penis um, that they can go and use to um, to like basically release their eggs into another barnacle that is nearby. Um, so most of them are hermaphrodites where they have male and female parts, but they are trying to cross fertilize. Um, here's a video by um, Karen Murphy, barnacles filter feeding that shows you what that looks like besides just having a gift. So what is the role of arthropods? Well, they um, are an important source of food. Like we said, they also are good at recycling nutrients because they take the tiniest things and build them into much larger body material. And then they are often eaten by bigger things. They are pests in that they can foul different shrimps, but in some ways, um, that we didn't even mention is here's like a cleaner, sh um, shrimp that is going along and cleaning all over the face of an eel. The eel could definitely eat it, but doesn't want to because it's moving along and getting parasites off of it. And you can see a human here that is going up and opening her mouth so that a cleaning shrimp can clean out her mouth, which I would prefer not to do. Okay. We're moving on to 
um, a phylum that contains the arrowworms. So these are very common. They are um, planktonic where they can't move against a current. They are voracious feeders. They don't look like it on in this picture, but they do have these venomous um, teeth that they can go and spines and grab prey and eat it. Here's a video from Animal Fact Files, Arrowworm Facts, a venomous uh, worm with teeth that you can look at for more information. But it's a very um, small group, so we are now going to move on to the phylum of echinoderms that has all the spiny skins. So the spiny, echinoderm means spiny skins, but the spiny skins are like sea stars, urchins, cucumbers. Um, they have bilateral symmetry where they could be cut down here and be the same on both sides. They have spines that are out, these outward projections on their skin um, and have this pincher-like mechanism in, in them called the pedicillary that keep parasites and larvae off of them because they would otherwise just move into the top of their, of their skin. So they have... Um, Papulae that function for gas exchange. They have paired gonads. In each of these rays, um, they have digestive glands. Um, the central disc here has um, the stomach, the anus, the madreporite, which you can't see. Well, you can see right here. On the top side, there is this little like almost freckle on the top side, not the bottom side of um, sea stars and that freckle is called the madreporite and that brings water in from the top um, and then they also have a ring canal on them so um, here is just like another picture of the of what it looks like underneath with the spines that have the pedicillary. Um, you can't see the madreporite here because it's on the top side and this is the bottom side with the tube feet. So with sea stars, they have at least five rays that go out, but they can have a lot more. Um, the top side is usually spiny. Interesting thing, um, they can walk along. Here's a video from Zeb Halleck, starfish walking on the beach. Some people call it a starfish. That's not a real thing, but since it's a common name, you know, a lot of people do it. They actually are sea stars. And here's a video from Deep Marine Scenes, Facts, Crown of Thorns, starfish. Okay, so with the sea stars, um, most of them are scavengers or carnivores and they can very effectively hunt. So here is a star, and this star almost looks like it's lost a leg at some point, but it's still hunting this anemone. And the anemone is smart enough to go, I am being hunted, and moves away um, to try to get away from this star before it is eaten. Um, here's another gif that shows one of them pulling in a bivalve and actually pushing it into position so that it can open it up and then it eviscerates or pours part of its stomach and stomach acids inside of the bivalve and dissolves it and then eats, eats the bivalve almost alive. So they can regenerate from breaking off one of their arms, um, but usually they need part of that circular disc attached in order to make that happen. However, they don't just multiply by breaking into pieces. They also have separate sexes of eggs and sperm that they release into the water um, so that they can produce and have some, reproduce and have some genetic diversity. Here's a video from Deep Marine Scenes facts about the sea star um, slash starfish. Okay, uh, the Ophiuroids are brittle stars, basket stars, and serpent stars. They um, are benthic, meaning they live on the ocean floor, but you can find them on tide pools, but that is the ocean floor. When it's not that deep, that's the ocean floor. So when you turn over rocks and you find these, you wanna be really careful because they do, they're called brittle stars for a reason. Um, they break off really, really easily. But you'll notice that if you ever do turn over a rock and see these, they often move very quickly to hide and that's because they do have 
um, very, very sensitive like eye spots that do not like to be exposed to bright light. So they will, um, they don't have pedicillary, so no pinchers on these guys. And um, they do filter feed um, or like basket stars will suspension feed. Uh, more pictures of them. Here's the brittle stars. Um, they are very sensitive to light. Here's a video from Deep Marine Scenes, facts on the brittle stars. Sea urchins and their relatives are enclosed by something that's called a test. So when you see these beautiful little um, leftover bodies, these are called the test. And out from them radiate all of the movable spines and they can move their spines. Like if you stick your finger down the middle of the spines, all of the spines will close around your fingers. They um, can be grazers or deposit feeders. Um, here in Southern California, they can be, this purple urchin that we have in Southern California has a population right now that is way, way too big and is out of control. Um, sea stars will go and feed on them. We used to in Southern California have the California sea otter, but we hunted it to extinction. So now it's only found um, in California, in uh, Northern California, but um, these, um, sea otters will actually go and grab urchins and then they have a calloused part on their chest and they'll take like a rock and break open the urchins and eat the insides the problem with the infestation of the urchins is that as grazers for the california purple sea urchins they will go up to kelp and just eat the base of the kelp and so the entire algae above it will get broken off and float to the top because of the air bladders that are on it. So it floats away and then you've just killed this whole kelp that would otherwise be photosynthesizing and making food and making shelter for all these other organisms. So they are a little bit out of control in Southern California right now. Uh, sea cucumbers do have a full respiratory system um, called respiratory trees uh, that are tubes for breathing. Their uh, sexes are separate and they are really, really instrumental in cleaning uh, the ocean. You can find them very commonly here in Southern California. Um, and here's a video from BBC Earth, Pearlfish's Gross Hiding Spot. They um, form, and I would consider this a parasitic relationship for sure, but the um, pearl fish will actually go inside of the anus of the sea cucumbers and live inside of it. And then for food, it will actually eat the sea cucumbers gonads. And then it will invite in its friends to have um, sexual like breeding events. And then the friends will also eat the gonads. When they eventually leave though, the sea cucumber does grow its gonads back and usually has a strong um, growth of gonads. And so some people consider this a mutualistic relationship, but I definitely consider it parasitic. So depends on how you look at it. But these guys go along the ocean floor bottom and they bring in a bunch of sediment. Think of something like an earthworm where they bring in all of the nasty stuff and then even though it's hard to imagine that this is super clean sand, they have digested out and left this very, very clean sand as a deposit. So it's a very important cleaner for the ocean. As a defensive behavior, since these guys are pretty defenseless, they can eviscerate themselves where they push out all of their organs and say, eat that, not me. And then it moves away and regrows its organs. Or it can let off these um, Cuvarian tubules, which is this like sticky white spaghetti that it like sticks to um, the other organism to slow it down while it gets away. So here's a video beyond the senses. Sea cucumber walking up, waking up to eat is just amazing. And it really is. Crinoids, the first time I saw one of these, I literally thought I was going crazy under the water scuba diving in Australia. Um, because it's just this walking or swimming feathery organism swimming along. And these are called feather star stars or just crinoids, but they can um, attach with these feet 
um, they grasp called Siri and they'll grasp on and filter feed for a while and then they'll swim away to a new spot or some of them will grow a stalk and will plant in a specific place but this one in this gif is actually moving because something came over to prey on the stock and so it broke off from the part that was getting eaten and it's climbing away till it can find a safe place so this is a video by nat geo wild feather stars and their animal um, invaders it will actually show here a relationship it has with different um, animals like fish or shrimp that will disguise themselves to match exactly inside of its crinoid and then even crazier they have done experience experiments where they've moved like a shrimp um, from one crinoid to another crinoid of the same species and it looks the same and the shrimp will actually show fidelity and move back to its original crinoid like it has a relationship with that one specific crinoid and it knows it. So the ecological role of the spiny skins called the echinoderms is that um, they can be predators, they can deter predators, um, they urchins will eat coral um sea cucumbers are being looked at because they actually have a toxin that can rupture red blood cells and that's being looked at as a potential medicine here's a bat star which you can commonly find in southern california tide pools that i wanted to highlight there so in the phylum hemichordates these are sessile they burrow down into this um, sediment they have a large proboscis um, mouth part that they use to dig burrows and eat the sediment. This is a video by Deep Marine Scenes Facts, the acorn worm, that you can look up more about that one. So then there's also invertebrate chordates. And when you see something like this in the ocean, you might just think it's a plant, but it's absolutely not. And it's very, um, it's got some really cool characteristics like in its anatomy that makes it very, very animal-like, like having a nodal cord or gill slits or a post-anal tail or a hollow ner nerve tube. Here I highlighted sea um, squirts, but you really want to be careful when you see these to not step on them and not damage them because they are a delicate animal. Um, the tunicates are mostly sessile, but they are widely distributed like the larvaceans, the, the salps, or the sea squirts. Here's a video from Evie Nautilus eye-catching translucent tunicate and sea cucumber and a video from deep marine scenes facts the squirts um, sea squirts will actually squirt out all their water when they're bothered um, they bring in water through one siphon and out through another and they circulate food following the red arrows and they're usually filter feeders here's a video by animal fact files tunicate facts no backbone here and um, they are usually solitary, but they can live in colonies or just a compound like a few of them. They are short-lived. Um, here's a video from Deep Marine Scenes, the facts, sea squirts. Salps and larvaceans are really interesting. Salps are free-swimming tunicates with um, in-current and out-current siphons to siphon the water, or larvaceans, like this little fishy guy, that actually produce these huge mucus nets over time and then they just the mucus nets like this big booger in this in the sea will catch a bunch of things for it to eat and when the mucus net gets too big it breaks it off and it starts a new mucus net well the crazy thing is these mucus nets continue to fall through the water column collecting a lot of other organisms and end up being huge food sources for the things at the bottom of the ocean and are part of marine snow so this is a video by um show an ode to salps our gelatinous marine cousin and then the cephalochordates are like the lance lancelets that are eel-like in their behavior and suspension feed here's a video by shape of life chordate animation amphius to vertebrate body plan and a video by devon um, johnson hogan eurochordate and cephalochordata so that finishes our entire chapter nine with um, higher invertebrates. I hope you learned about some new organisms that you want to study and look at when you go into the ocean.